What's up, guy? What is up, guy? Welcome back to Josue. Has to say, if you're new here, I am Josue, and this is what I have to say. Before we begin this episode, please remember, smash that like button, comment that comment, and share this episode with a friend or two, as it does help the podcast grow. And if you ain't growing, you're rotting. Today's episode. Well, actually, last episode, I talked a little bit about the benefits of shrooms for mental illness, cognitive performance, and furthering a little bit on that topic and the whole neurology thing, I brought over this gentleman with an interesting device up his nose right now. I'm assuming no previous <laughs> guest has walked in here with I mean, uh, light you're, up you're, their nose. You, I got to say you're the first, man. You're definitely the fucking first. Love it. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. So Toby Passman, right? Is that a pronounce that yes. correct? Toby Passman is a gentleman across from me at this moment with this interesting device. And you focus m majorly on neuro connectivity, training the brain, becoming a better brain, basically. Yep. Helping people build better brains through the use of applying cutting edge neuroscience research. So before we get into your background, give me, because whoever's watching this right now is probably like, what the fuck does he have up as a nose? <laughs> and for people that are listening to the podcast, he, uh, it's this device that uh, is connected to, what would we call that, I guess? The little, I don't know, little input device. I don't know what little, you would call it. Okay, this. input <laughs> device. And then it has two kind of like white uh connected and i don't even know what to call yeah. it it's like plugs up your nose yes and i see your nose lighting up red like rudolph yes so, uh, <laughs> so basically what's going on here this is a technology called intranasal brain photobiomodulation so basically it's a mouthful yeah well, it is a, a mouthful. nose full <laughs> a nose full <laughs> also known as light therapy so okay. infrared and red light have really powerful effects on all the cells in our body. You may have seen those like full body panels before, like I, the red. I actually have one at home. You have one at home. Yeah. There you go. So you already know the benefits yeah, yeah, yeah. of that. So basically the uh, ones for the brain are similar, but they're at a higher wavelength of light that are specifically absorbed by the mitochondria within the brain. So really increasing cellular energy production within the neurons. And that just helps overall cognition. I mean, there's studies with this looking at anxiety, depression, healing traumatic brain injuries, depression. I, think I just said depression. Um, but, man, just across the whole scope of different conditions. And then also athletes, executives, that's kind of the focus with Neuroflex. My business is really focusing on the biohacking peak performance community and really helping get those guys, you know, the maximal uh, productivity and to minimize distraction utilizing these modalities. So how long or how many, how often would you have to wear a device like that to kind of like enhance your cognitive abilities or? So I describe it kind of like working out, right? Where mm -hmm. if you're not regularly going to the gym and you go and work out one time, like no matter how hard you go, you're not gonna wake up the next morning completely shredded, right? So it's a process that takes time. It's not like popping a pill where you feel the effects right away. I mean, you could potentially like after, especially with this, I usually do feel a little bit more energized, just cognitively clear, like I've kind of gotten rid of the cobwebs in my brain. So, but it, it generally is a process of training the brain where you're really wanting to do, you know, multiple sessions. So the way I work with people oftentimes with a two month program. So once we get people to 20, 30, 40 sessions, that's what it takes to get really long term significant changes in brain functionality. Because the thing with the brain is, it's always going to try to revert back to what it's always known, even if that's comfort, a dysfunctional yeah. pattern. Yeah, comfort. So in order to really push the <coughs> brain and train, change the brain kind of on a permanent level, you do have to get that repetition in the same way if you're wanting to get in great shape. You got to consistently hit the gym. Everything's consistency in life, no matter what. Absolutely. Um, it's funny because uh, I was like I was telling you off camera, like the topics that I generally cover are things that I'm interested in. It's not I don't have a niche per se. So it was interesting when, when you hit me up like, hey, you know, I'd love to talk to you, to you uh, on your pod about this because I heard about neuroplasticity, which is like the ability to kind of like rewire your, your brain, whatever, through yeah. this. Uh, it's an app called Lumosity. I don't know if you ever yeah. heard about it. Yep. Those brain games. Yep. So I haven't done it in a while, but I started like in 2017 or something like that. And I say pretty consistent with it, probably like eight, nine months, almost to a year. And I noticed how like quicker I was for so many things. My memory improved and 
it's just overall, you know, like like you said, repetition. You just rewire shit in your brain, man. Like it's it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, our brain's so malleable. People mm-hmm. like neuro, even neuroscientists used to think before, prior to a few decades ago, they used to think that you know, as we develop throughout adolescence, our brain just kind of became fixed, and that we didn't really nah, fuck you know, that, grow dude. new connections. Yeah, that's, that's just clay. All BS. Yeah, yeah. So you now, no, literally, people up into their nineties can still generate new neurons and new connections among cells. So no matter what age people are, no matter where they're at, that's my message for people is you can rewire your brain and improve. When you improve the biological functioning of your brain, you become happier, healthier, and wealthier. Sure. I was watching this TED Talk uh, a while back that was saying how um, people that are negative or sad often or just depressed type of thing, that a lot of it is uh, due to you being familiar with it. It's kind of like you become addicted to being sad. And as you focus on, you know, ha- taking actions that make you happier or prouder of yourself or things of that nature, you start rewiring that to not being as valid. You know what I mean? You yep. literally reshape your thought process on things. Yeah, exactly. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, so Toby, give me a little bit about you. Who's Toby? What's your background? Yeah, How'd man. you get into this field? Yeah. So, you know, really from an early age, you know, I was affected personally by a mental health issue, you know, within my family, Mm -hmm. I lost a close family member to suicide, you know, due to obviously depression. So it was always a personal kind of topic that just impacted, yeah. yeah, yeah, personal connection. And then growing up, you know, throughout middle school, high school, even into college, I really had a lot of social anxiety and awkwardness. I mean, I could have never imagined being <laughs> being right here where I am today, actually speaking to someone on camera. Same. Doing yeah. A, yeah. So I was like, it was, again, you know, like this personal thing where I was like, I was on this quest to figure out like what was going on. Like I was starting to, you know, watch like the Bulletproof podcast, like Dave Asprey oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Biohacking. And, like, uh, learning, super cool guy. Yeah. Learning about how I could actually optimize my brain. So mm-hmm. I started playing around with different stuff started working at a research lab at my university where we were back basically learning how to measure and analyze people's brain waves. So the brain waves are the electrical rhythms that are really driving all of our thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and cognitive abilities. And we can actually measure that with this swim cap looking device called an EEG cap. So this is able is to Is that the way you're going to connect me to her? Uh, we can. Later today? We oh. can. It's a little bit of a lengthy process, but if you're up for it, we definitely okay. can. I might be. I might yeah. be. See what's going on in there. We're able to measure. I'm sure many of my followers are wondering <laughs> yeah. what the fuck is going on up there. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we're able to measure like 19 different areas of your brain nice. and see areas that are either underactive, overactive, or producing healthy amounts of activity. Areas like, you don't got to name all 19, but like what's. Oh, the, I mean, we function? look at like the frontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex, uh, the amygdala, the parietal lobes, occipital lobes. So all these different areas of the brain that have different functions. So when you pair that together with someone's symptoms, if you're telling me, hey, Toby, I'm struggling with my focus and I'm forgetting people's names, that's going to point me to like start thinking about, okay, you might have frontal or possibly temporal lobe issues. And then with the brain map, we can really like confirm that. So to me, when I did a brain map on myself, so much made sense because an area... So that specifically is called brain mapping. Brain mapping. Yeah. So it's a type of brain scan where it's basically measuring your brainwave activity. And that's what I was doing at my college research lab. And when I did uh, an initial brain map on myself, I found that an area of my left frontal lobe that is particularly involved in verbal fluency, which is something I always struggled with, that was a big component of my social anxiety, was that I could never figure out, I could never find the right word that I was looking for in conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously that then made it a very choppy, kind of interaction led to a lot of awkwardness and then it became that vicious cycle of just feeling more and more anxious and you know isolated from other people so i realized that at that point that what i was experiencing was not like a moral failing on my part which i think a lot of people with mental health issues there's a lot of shame and stigma around it still Mm -hmm. you know it's getting better but i at that point kind of realized no this is actually like a biological issue with the way my brain is working in the same way that if you break your leg and you have to have a cast, you know, people see that. So it's like they're, you know, people will have more empathy, but it's like the brain. It's like, I view mental health issues as the same, same as that. You just can't see what's going on in someone's brain unless you do a brain scan. Right. So to me, really being able to have that information on my own brain 
empowered me to then work with different modalities to actually retrain my brain. And I started noticing my verbal fluency got way better. So I started noticing I felt more fluid and comfortable in social interactions. And that led to so many benefits in my life. And the more I did it, the more I kind of continued to reinforce those patterns. And ultimately, it got to a point but ultimately it got to a point where I felt like I didn't even need to do the training anymore because I'd kind of rewired my brain with enough of the repetition um, to a point where I was just calm and, and, you know, relaxed in social situations, even though I, my brain was always wired to, to be fearful. You know, I was always afraid. I had like an anxious Jewish mother, you know, that was like always <laughs> telling me like, be Probably careful. Help, about, yeah. yeah, she's always telling me uh, to be careful about everything still to this day. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I think like my nervous system had been kind of wired for fear, you know, since mm-hmm. a young age. So really retraining my brain and like realizing that, it, you know, other people are not dangerous. It's not uh a harm to me to connect deeply with other people. So kind of starting to rewire those beliefs alongside improving my verbal fluency was really what, you know, vastly improved my social anxiety. So as I was doing that, I also was working with all of these other clients ranging from substance abuse and, you know, drug, drug addicts, alcoholics, people with a wide array of different mental health conditions, Mm -hmm. such as anxiety, depression, bipolar, PTSD, And then also peak performance. So clients, athletes, some Hollywood guys, executives um, that would come into this center outside of Seattle, actually Dave Asprey's Neuroscience Center. I I interned there called 40 Years of Zen. Super cool. We can talk about that. Yeah, it was a super cool experience. But basically, like I started seeing, in addition to the transformation that I went through, all of these clients also experiencing incredible positive benefits and just seeing like, why is this something that's not mainstream? And really the question, that question kind of led me to do what I'm doing today with my company, you know, to really help bring these modalities to the mass market. Because I think they can benefit so many people who have never even, I mean, you probably, had you ever heard about brain mapping or neurofeedback? No, never. Pro- which that's is like why most I thought it was people, fascinating, yeah. Which is like most people. But the crazy thing is, it's nothing new. This stuff's been around for decades. It's just been buried away because you know big pharma you know the yeah, western it medical system doesn't make not, money yeah, yeah. it doesn't yeah yeah there's no billion dollar neurofeedback companies yet hopefully i could be the first hey okay, speak it man <laughs> but um but yeah man i mean it, so that's what my passion is really helping empower people to improve the way their brains work with all of this uh you know all these neuroscientific modalities so you talked about training and modalities what's some examples of how you can train the brain for, let's say, your, your social anxiety issue. Mm-hmm. What are some of the practices or trainings that you you, you did to, to help with that? Yeah, so one of the main modalities that I used was something called neurofeedback. Okay. So whereas brain mapping is simply measuring what your brain is doing. It's not giving any sort of stimulus to the brain. It's not asking the brain to change in any way. It's simply recording what the brain's doing. Whereas neurofeedback is recording what your brain is doing, but then also giving it feedback, rewarding it when it's doing well, and taking away that reward when it's not doing well. So like a dog. Yeah, like (laughs) operant conditioning. (laughs) So interestingly enough, so you can actually place electrodes. Like in my case, I connected those electrodes directly to that left frontal lobe that's really involved in verbal fluency. Mm -hmm. And I saw that there was one specific brain wave on my brain map that was really deficient, which was beta. So our beta brainwaves, that's our focus, concentration, kind of energizing brainwave. And that was really deficient on my brain map. So I basically trained my brain. I uh, instructed the system to reward my brain when it started producing more beta waves. So how that looks is basically you're you're connected to the electrodes and you're going to be playing like a game on your phone, on a tablet, through an app where basically you're you're like flying a spaceship or you're, you're... doing some kind of video game. Let's Mm -hmm. take the spaceship, for example. So when your spaceship is flying higher and the sound is getting louder, that's the positive feedback telling your brain, good job, you you know, keep doing what it is you're doing. Like when you're, when in this case, when I get into that beta brainwave pattern, I'm giving my brain that reward. Now, when my brain drifts out of that healthy state, then the reward's taken away. So the spaceship starts flying lower, the audio gets really quiet. 
And this is taking place within 100 milliseconds. So this is quicker than our conscious mind can even process information. So people always ask me, like, you know, starting neurofeedback sessions, like, what do I need to do to, you know, get the best score? And I'm like, you know, you really just sit back, focus on the screen, and your brain on a subconscious level really figures out what it needs to do um, to get that reward and, you know, rewires itself to have a lot healthier functioning. So through those little games, you slowly but surely you start to, I guess, rewire that, that cognitive performance, those uh, neurotransmitters? Yeah, the, so the neurotransmitters are definitely in play. We're mainly like focused on the brainwaves since mm -hmm. to accurately measure someone's neurotransmitter levels, you'd have so to do So explain the tap. difference between both because yes. most people will probably That's not important know. One. Yeah. yeah, so basically neurotransmitters are, you know, the um, chemical signalers of the brain. So people have heard of dopamine, serotonin. serotonin. Yeah. Yep, those are a couple of the common ones. There's norepinephrine, oxytocin. They all have different functions. And then there's also the electrical side of things. So the reason that most research, at least in my field, is conducted with measuring people's brain waves is to accurately measure the neurotransmitters in someone's brain. You'd have to do a spinal tap. And that's probably going to be a bit hard to yeah. sell, pitch someone <laughs> on a spinal tap. Yeah, so, let me shove this up your spine. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of the reason that the majority of the research has gravitated towards measuring the electrical activity. So, so the, the activity. so the neurotransmitter is let's say the, the serotonin, right? Mm -hmm. Sending that message. Yep. Right. And then the wave is kind of like the report on how that's doing. On they're how the, how they're both taking place. Like there's both the the chemical signaling taking place where synapses or you know sending different chemical messengers such as serotonin or dopamine to different cells to different networks in the brain and then there's also the electrical rhythm so okay. basically the the brain runs on chemicals and electricity so there's a little tiny tiny electrical rhythms um, they kind of divvy based on their frequency that's how they categorize them so like the super slow frequencies are categorized as like delta or theta waves they're more so involved in our our sleep Whereas we have alpha waves, which is kind of a calm, relaxed state when people, you know, have have a little bit of cannabis or have a couple drinks. Mm -hmm. Those are both going to increase your alpha waves. So kind of keep, you know, that calm, relaxed uh, kind of idling rhythm of the brain. And then most of us are spending the majority of our waking consciousness within beta. Beta is our normal alert, awake state. You know, we're interacting with the world interacting with other people, sending emails, you know, doing all the day-to-day -day tasks, most people spend the majority of the day in beta. And then lastly, gamma is the fastest of the brain waves. It's basically like all, it's driving neuroplasticity. So it helps new areas of the brain connect in different ways. Um, so when you're learning something, maybe. When you're learning, exactly, okay. exactly. So psychedelic experiences, psychedelics greatly increase gamma waves in the brain, they found with a series of studies looking at long-term meditators, like mm -hmm. Tibetan monks, people who've been meditating for hours a day for years on end, they did these same brain scans on them, looking at, okay, what is different about these people's brains versus a non-meditator? And they found they had greatly increased strength of their gamma waves. And they sort of linked that, the researchers linked that to this increased present moment awareness, expanded consciousness that these meditators frequently report. Um, and then also like things like breath work. I've measured with my scans along with like reading research literature about breath work can sometimes even as powerfully as psychedelics be able to really cause these surges in gamma waves that facilitate neuroplasticity and really help people kind of shed limiting beliefs and rewire dysfunctional patterns within their brain. So all the different brain waves, they serve really important functions, but it's kind of like your, you know, if you if you get lab tests, you know, and you're looking at vitamins or hormones, there's issues. The levels, when, yeah. Yeah, there's issues. There's a normative range. There's like an optimal range, right? And you could be too low. You could have a deficiency, and that could cause issues. You could also occasionally have a toxicity. Too much, yeah. That's also going to cause issues. You so want to be in the sweet spot in the that middle. That Goldilocks zone. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're looking at with the brain map to see if someone was within those healthy uh, levels or whether they're deficient or overactive within each brainwave. 
You mentioned the uh, gamma and delta and all that. You've obviously heard of binaural beats. For sure. What's your thought on that? They work. Yeah. They work. I don't know. I don't always know about like the ones on YouTube, whether they're actual. Yeah, I don't know how like, accurate legit. that is. If it's but free, the then, you know, you're right. probably not. Yeah. Right. But the technology itself is yeah. legit. Yeah. Um, Andrew Huberman just reported about like the 40 hertz gamma binaural beats. So when you kind of pulse mm -hmm. or have these oscillations going at 40 cycles per second, so the tone is kind of getting played 40 times per second. The brain entrains to a gamma rhythm because it's at that same 40 cycle per second rhythm. So you can actually improve people's focus as well as memory with these uh, gamma binaural beats. But yeah, basically any of these different brainwave patterns you can entrain through the use of sound, through the use of light, um, through the use of neurofeedback, through the use of the electrodes. So there's a lot of different ways to, to skin a cat. I guess for a lack of better analogy <laughs> that's fascinating dude yeah that's why you see some people like studying sometimes and they'll put on you know yeah the, the correct hertz and then they're just there you know like if they had, were adderled up but without the yep. adderall. <laughs> exactly exactly so talk to me a little bit about uh you said your experience with dave asprey's uh facility yeah how was that it was cool um you know, it was my first job out of college. It was it was actually a funny story of how I actually started working there or got the opportunity to work there. I had, you know, like when you apply for like some contest, it was like a Facebook contest, mm -hmm. right? And I entered in my email to win a couple tickets to the Bulletproof Conference. This was back like 2015. And I applied completely, like forgot all about it. I don't know why you cannot ask me why I checked my spam folder when I did. But it was like two days prior to the conference. And in the spam folder in my email, I saw that I'd won the free, the two free uh, tickets. Imagine how, how do you not check that. Right? <laughs> like, I, that, it just That's like wild. is a head fuck when I think about that. Like, if what if I didn't check that? Like, how my whole, like, career trajectory could have been. Yeah, probably whole life a very trajectory. different fucking life. Yeah. yeah. Those little things. Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of wild looking back. But, yeah, so I won, won the couple tickets, bought a plane ticket down to California, and ended up talking to the guys at the 40 Years of Zen booth, and we were doing a lot of uh, kind of parallel work at my research lab at the time. So uh, it sort of made sense for me to start you know, working there. So they offered me an internship, and it was fascinating because in college, I was just doing you know, the, measure, the measurement, basically analyzing people's brain waves, but not really doing anything with that information. So it wasn't really change. I didn't feel like we we're actually like changing and helping people improve their brains in any way. Mm -hmm. You know, research is still helpful. Obviously, it can lead to a lot of downstream effects down the road. But at the moment, I wanted to like get I wanted to be like, OK, so we can measure what's going on in someone's brain. There's this neuroplasticity so we can improve someone's brain. So how do we do that? So the, the that sort of question led me to end up working at 40 Years of Zen because they, in addition to doing the measurement, you know, doing the brain scans, they also do neurofeedback, neurosimulation, uh, and all of these different modalities stacked with nootropics and gourmet food, like all of these different things together, as well as coaching. It was like a, a super, super cool and unique framework. Um, and just seeing like what is possible in terms of like when you throw everything possible at improving someone's brain performance and seeing what you can really do in a week. Cause I was what the program was, was like a five day intensive. Wow, that's wild. Yeah. It was a super cool experience. I ended up meeting like lifelong friends there and had a really, really great experience. Did you meet Dave himself or he wasn't? Yeah. yeah. yeah he was, he wasn't super in like involved in that day to day activities. He would come like every six weeks or so, but yeah, I definitely had a couple uh, one on one conversations with him. Yeah, he's, he's a fascinating dude, man. Yeah, like seeing his story of like how he used to be like this overweight like programmer, and now he's like you know this biohacker. Just I don't know, he's a fascinating dude. Yeah, he's just sitting guy. down with him, like he's one of the most intelligent people. Like just you can it seems just, like it. Yeah, just talking to him, like I'm like whoa, like <laughs> I need a minute to just like process this information because he, yeah, he's brilliant. Uh, tell me about your, I saw on your Instagram, you talk about uh, psil psilocybin. Uh -huh. I, was, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Psil psilocybin, right? Yeah. And the benefits of um, CBD or was it THC? THC? CBD? Probably CBD. CBD. CBD more. For the brain. Uh, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. I know that that has its, its components too to enhance cognitive performance. Yeah. Yeah. So CBD, kind of the non, 
I don't really like the term non psychoactive because it's still acting on the brain, but it's the non intoxicating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's just the non intoxicating <clears throat> molecule in cannabis that's you know has I think a lot of therapeutic potential in terms of being able to treat kids with like intractable epilepsy. There's like a strain or a, a documentary that came out called Charlotte's Web. Like there's a strain Charlotte's Web that's like this little girl was having like forty like epileptic fits or something per day and. This family found that through the use of, you know, utilizing CBD. It treated it? It treated it wow. and, like, brought it, like, way down. And they had tried, like, all sorts of, like, conventional seizure medications. Nothing had worked at all. They were, like, at their last at their last leg and ended up coming across that. So, yeah, there's some amazing stories about CBD. Um, it's definitely just a good kind of brain vitamin, you know. That's how I sort of view it. You know, it's not... Uh, a strong like effect at least mm -hmm. for me you know it can be a bit calming but just overall i think a great thing to add on just to your brain health regimen because it can really reduce neural inflammation it can increase signaling uh, within like serotonin and dopamine pathways so helping kind of build up some of those neurotransmitter levels uh, as well as working on anandamide which is like the bliss molecule the same one that thc works on but it just works on it in a different way so I'm a big fan of CBD. And then as far as psilocybin goes, you know, mushrooms, um, I think, have a ton of therapeutic potential. Yeah. Um, well, firsthand, I'm, I know that myself. <laughs> yeah. What was what was your experience? Um, like with 20, I was talking about our last podcast, but in 2018, I tried them for the first time. I had like this crazy ass trip. Fucking, I took way too much. I was tripping for like nine hours. But um, the thing was, uh, at that moment in time, I was 27, and I was probably like the shittiest couple of years of my life. Mm -hmm. So I was like, not in a good headspace, and shit wasn't going right for me. And after that trip, man, like, I was in heaven for like months, like six months. I was just like, my brain was like cleared up. Like, I was just happy naturally for no reason. And due to that better mood and better state of mind, I managed to get my life, you know, together. And it was for sure the fucking mushrooms because I did nothing else. And, yeah. then I, and then I read about, you know, how, how people use it for therapy and stuff. And right. I was like, well, there you fucking go. Yeah. yeah. And what's cool, what's really cool and what your experience highlights exactly is that mushrooms, unlike some other psychedelics, like, you know, ketamine therapy is like That's super the next popular. thing I want to talk to you about. Ketamine therapy yeah. is super popular right now. And like, you know, I think it definitely has a lot of therapeutic potential, specifically like people who are like really depressed, suicidal, you know, they can get a ketamine infusion and within pretty much instantly or within a few hours, they're going to feel like a lot better if it works for them, which the success rate is pretty good. The problem with ketamine, though, is that the effects don't really seem to last long term, contrary to psilocybin, where there's been some studies now that have looked at people's depression, uh, depression scores even a year out after taking a one, like a, a high dose psilocybin experience, just one time. Mm -hmm. And they found even a year later that different markers of depression were still lower. It's crazy, so, man. Versus like ketamine where people, you know, keep having to come back for more and more boosters and it doesn't seem to produce those long-term neurological changes um, that uh, psilocybin does. So I think that ketamine is like a good... Good, like, intro one for people who haven't done psychedelics. It's, like, a gentle kind of effect, I feel like, relative to, like, taking a bunch of shrooms or ayahuasca or something. But I think we're going to start seeing as some of these other things get either legalized or at least ha we have more, like, medical access to these things, like psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, yeah. I think have way greater therapeutic potential than ketamine. With ketamine, I was watching a documentary the other day on uh, Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Take Care of Maya. Sounds really familiar. Oh, I did watch. Yes, Bro, yes, yes. if you haven't seen that uh, shit, get a fucking box of Kleenex. Or don't watch it next to, like, your girlfriend or anything because she's not going to respect you after that. That's the saddest <laughs> fucking shit I've uh, ever seen. And ketamine was part of it because she right. had that neurological nervous system disease. I forget what the, what the name was. And ketamine was what helped her out. That's right. the, the whole reason why it was an issue with the hospital in the first place, because they were like, what the fuck? Why are you administering ketamine to your child? And right. Yeah. The whole, well, you know, the whole thing went. Yeah, man. I already had like a phobia of like doctors and hospitals. I was always oh, sick that, as a that kid. Solidified, and, like, uh, it just solidified like, man, I feel like if, if I'm not a parent right now, but if in the future, man, I would never, I would take my kid to the hospital at the very last resort because I do not trust those people. I lost my shit <laughs> without, without a doc. I was like, damn, this is <laughs> intense. Yeah. 
I mean, so, I think Western medicine, it just highlights that Western medicine oh, is yeah, great if, if you break your leg and you need an emergency surgery or whatever. But in terms of managing long-term conditions. No, it's terrible. Terrible. It's terrible. Terrible. It's the last place you want to fucking go to. Exactly. Toby, so I know you brought a bunch of these little devices. So yes. talk to me a little bit about these devices, what they do, and which ones are going to hook me up to to see what's yeah. going to happen. Absolutely. <laughs> so we can break out uh, the first one here. This is an infrared light helmet. So this guy here. So let's see which... Uh, I'm going to show it to you there. Both, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, inside of here, there's 256 LEDs that all deliver near-infrared light to the brain. Okay. So, the so it penetrates the skull, the hair, all that. Yes. Penetrates the skull, um, gets into the cortex, kind of the outermost part of the brain, and it's greatly accelerating energy production in the brain, so driving more blood flow and oxygen, reduces neural inflammation, um, as well as promoting neurogenesis, so actually gr helping grow new neurons and new connections amongst those cells. So it's a really cool piece of equipment that we can customize, so based on the effect that you want, right? We talked about those different brain waves, you know, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma, they each have different effects. So, for instance, you tell me how do you want to feel like kind of more calm, do you want to feel more focused and stimulated, do you want kind of a mood boost, like how do you want to feel? Stimulated. Stimulated. Yes. Okay. So I'll put you at a 20 hertz beta rhythm. So basically the light is going to be flickering 20 times per second. And that actually entrains your brain to start creating a 20 cycle per second rhythm, which okay. is a beta rhythm. Okay. So you can see this when I start this up. So if the camera is able to ca capture this, the light, you can see how the light is flickering very quickly. So about like 20 times per second. So these red lights are just showing that the device is on because near infrared is invisible to the naked eye. Mm -hmm. So kind of like infrared saunas, right? Where it's like heat energy. And that's kind of what this is. You're going to feel your, your head start to get warm because um, it's the infrared is, is heat. So maybe like, maybe like 10 minutes here. Since it's your first session, I'll just put you like 50% capacity. So oh, boy. Let's, let's do this. So for those uh, with only audio, it's kind of like this white helmet that has a bunch of infrared and, and red light inside, right? Mo yeah, almost all in infrared. Yeah, those red lights are just the test sensors. It's a little just to snug. show you that it's on. Yeah. So. so at what point am I supposed to start feeling, I don't know, something or more stimulated or... You might feel it a few minutes in. Yeah. Do you feel like, in general, like, do you feel, like, pretty sensitive to, like, if you are to take, like, I don't know, a medication or supplement or drug? Like, do you feel like you feel it? <laughs> no. A lot, I, was pretty, like, I was born in okay. Miami, man. <laughs> you know <laughs> You know what? Okay, I'm cranking you up then. I'm cranking you up because I want to see if we can get, get you to feel something here. So I'll, I'll crank you up a little bit. If I don't make it, just make sure that someone changes my uh, my app to what I had to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I don't make it out of here. <laughs> But yeah, man, so okay. a few minutes in potentially. So sometimes people will tell me, you know, that they feel just clearer, more energy, more focus, you know, particularly what we have you on here. This frequency has been shown in research to maximize the blood flow benefits out of any frequency they've studied. So really good one. This would be great for like the morning when you wake up like all groggy and shit. Dude, you just slap the helmet on and... Da -da 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 -da. That's, that's yeah, that's morning. what you do. Dude, literally, I make myself a cup of espresso and put and on the helmet. Thing. Yep, I swear to God, every single morning, I have one of these in my living room. I just that is hilarious. You imagine you see this guy out on his balcony, like with a helmet every morning. So he's looking at you, like, what is this guy? Oh, he just walks around in his robe with coffee and a helmet on. Oh, but imagine <laughs> while I'm driving and people see me with like the intranasal pro. No. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh, that is wild. And people probably think I'm, I'm just. I don't even know. Hey, I am kind of crazy, but... I mean, are we all? Are we yeah. all? Are we okay. fucking all? Yeah. I'm just like, I don't really care. Um, Might as well just do your do your thing, right? So how you wear this every morning? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. And you alter it depending on what you're... You want the feedback to be from your brain, what response you want, you know, if you want to be more chill or... Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of like certain frequencies in general. You know, my brain kind of runs on the slower side as a lot... Like I have ADHD and a lot of people... With ADD, they have an excess of like alpha and theta brain waves, the slower brain waves. So you're kind of more, you're super creative and have a lot of different thoughts and ideas going through your head, but sometimes have issues just really like 
lasering in on one specific task. Mm -hmm. So I'll usually put myself on more stimulating brain waves just because that's kind of what my brain responds best to. Whereas other people who are more so on like the, the super anxious OCD, uh, insomnia kind of you brain chill, type, chill them out. They need to chill them out a little bit. I think I feel like something. Yeah. 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 What do you like kind of a perception? Yeah. Like more, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. I mean, cause yeah, the but I can, I can tell that I, I can tell there's a shift. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's for sure. cool. Cause most, yeah, I would say it's almost like 50, 50, the people who they take it off and I'm like, you feel anything? And they're like, no, what was I supposed to feel? But then like, yeah, it's like know. a perception kind of like, it's a shift. Like you feel yeah. it. I don't know. Yeah. It's almost like a microdose, right? Where yeah, it's, yeah, like yeah, where yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. You're not tripping, but That's like, a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah it's just that the little extra edge. So yeah, this is an awesome tool to start. So whenever we start sessions, when I work with clients, we start with utilizing some kind of infrared device, whether it's the intranasal, whether it's the helmet. I also have like a forehead band. So the light is really great at warming the brain up on a cellular level. So just as you would warm up your body, that's kind of how I view the light as a great cellular warm up. Because when you're doing something like neurofeedback, where mm -hmm. you're helping your brain produce healthier rhythms and really retraining the electrical activity of the brain, it's a very energy demanding process. So it makes perfect sense to be able to give your brain the most amount of cellular energy with the infrared light prior to doing neurofeedback. And for a while, that was just theoretical. People in the field were doing it. But now there's actually some research that's come out to validate that neurofeedback actually will work better synergistically when you do the infrared light first. So, so this is a great a precursor to the, to the brain mapping. Um, no? Well, so the brain mapping we would usually do to like measure your brain, see what your brain is. Right. But would best. this be beneficial to use before the brain map? Like would it get shit I don't know, moving around or am well, I we want to see with the brain map, just how your brain is doing at like a oh, baseline. Right. So then you would like want a natural. Gotcha. Yeah. But prior to like neurofeedback, which is like what we would do after the brain map. Mm -hmm. So as far as like the brain training is that the map is just the assessment. So we'd want you to just be free of like, we wouldn't want you to that makes pound a, a colada or anything right before doing it. It's going to skew the results. Well. Or if you threw this on. <laughs> Crowd them at colada. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good shit, dude. Yeah, man. And um, the other, now you could leave this on, but just asking, uh, the other devices mm -hmm. uh, run through those? Yeah. So there's an audio visual entrainment machine that mm -hmm. I utilize. So basically through, use of uh, tones that go in through the ears so it's actually similar to binaural beats. beats bit different technology called isochronic tones so you can kind of change the electrical firing of the brain through that as well as these glasses these kind of glasses that flicker really fast um they're kind of cool like strobe light sort of flickers oh, but what's the difference between a binaural beat and the iso the isochronic tones um, they, they're very similar. Like, I don't even, I, I'm not an expert as far as like that specific technology goes, okay. but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a powerful tool when you use it, you know, with the, the headphones paired with the glasses and also that's paired. So there's like three things, the headphones, the glasses, and then there's also a couple ear clips, okay. uh, one on each ear that actually delivers a very low intensity electrical current through the brain. So it sounds a lot scarier than it actually is. <laughs> so neurostimulation is a, is a really amazing uh, modality where by running uh, electricity through the brain, uh, very low intensity electricity, you can actually increase blood flow and oxygen to the brain. You can ramp up production of norepinephrine, which helps with focus, right. serotonin, which boosts your mood, as well as actually increasing endorphins, which are like an, our endogenous opioids that help us combat pain. So with the use of that technology, that usually gets people into like a very deep kind of meditative state. And it's just completely effortlessly because it's in training your brain rather than you having to sit on a cushion and try to like force yourself to meditate and like be super frustrated with this. You just lay back and it takes your brain, you know, kind of walks you through the whole different range of frequencies associated with advanced meditation without the effort. So what kind of person would med be uh, benefit from that, from using the modality? Generally, generally the more anxious types, you know, sleep issues respond really, really well to it. Anxiety, OCD, um, PTSD, there are specific protocols that are really focusing on balancing out the brain for like depression because there's certain uh, occurrences like 
there's certain findings that are usually seen on someone's brain map. Like when, when someone is clinically depressed, they generally have uh, more alpha waves on the left side of their brain compared to the right. So by utilizing um, these, there's a protocol that helps balance out the alpha waves. So between both hemispheres, mm-hmm. you can actually do that um, to improve, you know, things like mood, but really just overall relaxation. I mean, to me, I throw it on like midday if I'm trying to get like a quick power nap in and wake up 30, 45 minutes later feeling like a million bucks. That's cool shit, dude. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's one. Um, there's also, what have we not talked about? Um, there's a, a trainer. There's basically an, another type of neurofeedback that's actually training you to increase blood flow and oxygen to your brain, to the prefrontal cortex. So it's like a band not sure if I have it with me. Oh, I think I saw it on your Instagram. Yeah, yeah you've yeah, seen yeah. it. So it's basically, so traditional neurofeedback, what I normally utilize is basically, um, you know, training and measuring the electrical activity. But with this type of neurofeedback, it's actually able to um, sense the blood flow mm-hmm. and oxygenation to that prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex, why people need to know and care about that is that is like our most, that's like the most human part of our brain. Compared to the brains of other mammals, like we have a lot of similar structures, but the prefrontal cortex in humans is like way larger than in cats or dogs. You know, there's like a hierarchy where it's like. Well, when you say human, you mean like humane or no, like no, in charge like, of, but for example, for like for I don't know compassion or what kind. I of- was just saying like in humans, like in terms of like people have larger prefrontal cortexes. Or cortices right. and animals, right? But what does that make us? What is oh, what so what's fu- it, oh, okay. right? What function? Yeah. What makes us? Yeah, you know? right, right, right. So that's sort of our our forethought, our ability to plan out like long term, yeah. you know, decisions um, to be able to inhibit impulses, mm-hmm. right? Because I mean, think about self control, like, self control. Okay. So when you drink, that's basically turning off the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> ah, yes. So think about all the things <laughs> when you drink. You say the first thing that comes out. You become you know, more animal like. Yeah, you become yeah. a more animal like. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So all those things, that's like you're basically, when you think about what the prefrontal cortex controls, just think about what you do when you get drunk. That's all of those functions going offline. <laughs> so, so you can actually, instead yeah. of that, you can actually train to have a stronger prefrontal cortex. And that they've actually found that the ability so get drunk and put the device on and try and <laughs> maybe balance you out like instead of a cold shower. Yeah. Man, I haven't tried that one. Well, no, you know what sure. you got to do when you get home. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, it's it's a super important area that I was gonna say about willpower that they mm. found that you know, yeah, have you ever heard of the marshmallow test? No, what is it? Okay, so this was like a, a psychology experiment. They repeated it a bunch of times, but it was a psychology experiment, I think, in the 1960s where they basically gave kids a marshmallow, like mm-hmm. one marshmallow. The researcher told them, hey, you know, you can eat this one marshmallow. You're totally fine. Or if you wait, I think it's like 15 minutes, we will bring you two marshmallows. So it's basically measuring, you know, our ability to delay gratification in order to get a greater reward. And when you think about like all of life, like, you know, in order to master a skill, what do you have to do? Delay gratification. Like you have to be able to tune out, you know, like the vices of, you know, whatever, you know, porn and social media. Most of our generations fucked when it comes to that. (laughs) Right. Right. But the people who are like uber successful, I was just reading in a book today where they're uh, a Grant Cardone book, actually, where he's talking about like, the trait that they've found like amongst like all high performers, like the number one trait is that ability to delay gratification, gratification, which is that prefrontal cortex. So the stronger your prefrontal cortex is the smarter decisions that you're going to be able to make. That's why it's kind of the executive functioning. It's that executive part of our brain that makes complete sense. Calling all the shots. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bridge, a leader from a, from a follower or someone uh, great from someone regular. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So after this, and, and by the way, how are you feeling with, with more this? engaged you, for sure? More, more engaged, yeah, like focused. I think yep. more, yeah, yeah. That's what I would expect. Cool, yeah. It's, yeah, it's fucking crazy though. Yeah, that's <laughs> wild, right? Can we do the brain mapping? Is uh, yeah, yeah, we can let's, definitely do that. Let's try that out. Yep, be interested to see to take a look under the hood. Yes. So with the brain map, can I take us off already? Or? Um, yeah, yeah. Yep. You only got like a minute left, so I'll stop it here. So with the brain map. Hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. All 
that heat. You might want to have a little bit of water. They recommend just drinking a bit of water after the session. Same way after a workout, you want to drink a little bit of water. It was dehydrate you? Um, yeah, it kind of is burning through the glucose stores within your brain. And yeah, it'd be a good idea just to replenish with okay. some water. So this device here, this is an amplifier um, that is able to pick up the tiny electrical signals that are emanating from your brain okay. up to your scalp. So... Let me get out, there's going to be a bunch of different things that are going to come out here. So we're going to have, this is the cap. So this guy, this retro looking cap, they definitely didn't have style as the number one priority <laughs> creating this, but this is the gold standard. It's like a used. swimmer's cap. Yep, right. yep. Yeah, this is the gold standard that's used in every research lab clinic that I've worked at has utilized these. Okay. So this is a 19 channel cap. So it's going to be able to measure your brainwave activity at all 19 different areas that we're going to look at. So it's going to connect to my computer. This is wild. Let's see where we <laughs> want to set this up. Yeah. Actually, it'll be cool to like show the Laughing back there. <laughs> I could close my computer out. Once I get it going, I can like turn it around so we can like show the camera yeah, all, yeah, all yeah. the cool that'd, stuff that's going to be, be cool, on the yeah. screen. But yeah, so this gel is what this is like an electrolyte solution that okay. I squirt into each of these electrodes that actually helps me pick up and read the electrical signal that your brain is giving off. This is a little bit of skin prep gel. So this okay. is going to go kind of in your hair. Okay. Just get any of the natural oils off of your skin and hair okay. in order for us to get a nice, clean connection. Oh, we're going deep, deep with this. Oh, we're going all in with this. Yes, sir. So for those just listening, um, we have the amplifier on the table, which I guess goes connected to the cap, right? Yes. And the cap just kind of looks like a, like a swimmer's cap with a bunch of little... What do we call this? Yeah, uh, those electrodes. Electrodes? Yeah. So I'm snapping that on my head, and then he's plugging it to the computer, and the computer's going to tell him what, what the, We're what gonna the signals are looking like in there. It's going to be, <laughs> you know what? The brain map is, it can be oftentimes like a, a very like intimate experience where you actually get to like learn and understand like oh why you are the way you are. Nice. On a really core level. Well, so. I fuck with that. So yeah. All right, let's do it. Let's run it. All right. So and last piece of equipment here. Something. <laughs> He's going to turn that on. He's going to be like, how have you gotten this far in life? <laughs> <laughs> like, I actually see it completely flat. Line. There's like no activity. There's zero brain activity. You might be dead. I don't know. No. Um, and lastly, this is a blunt tip needle. So okay. not actually injecting anything, even though I joke about that I'm injecting. No, I was like, where's that brain. going? <laughs> yeah. So this is just a blunt tip needle that's to insert the gel into each of these tiny little electrode sites. Gotcha. Get an alcohol wipe. Well, I'm excited. This is this is more exciting than the than the helmet. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yep. Okay. So I am gonna squirt a little bit of this gel on an alcohol pad. And I'm gonna come over there. All right. Do I need to put my hair down or just this works? Um, let me see where that knot is. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind putting your hair down, that would be helpful. Go down the lines, man. Cool. <laughs> I actually washed my hair today for you, so be thankful because uh, I don't think many men have heard that come from me before. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Women always get so pissed off with me when I'm, like, putting gel in their hair. and It's like they do make dry caps, but they're, like, brand new, so they're, like, 25 grand. They do look super Holy cool. Holy shit. Though. So how much is, would this go for? Um, these EEG caps, each one's like five, 600, something around there. But then you have the amplifier, which is another. The amplifier is the most expensive piece of equipment. That's about like seven grand. Some, some Holy run shit. you up 10 to 15. And then the software that integrates everything. So it's, it's not something that I really recommend people. Like this is something you would go to a clinic, uh, you know, to get done. You're not going to necessarily want to 
buy all this equipment and spend all this time trying to learn this stuff yourself. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Unless you're like super, you know, interested in it or some shit. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, there's definitely the hardcore biohackers mm-hmm. who are just like going to go all in. So for those listening, he just uh, put that gel, I guess, on my hair. Yes. To not make the, to to help the the connectivity, right? Correct. Yeah. To actually be able to pick up those electrical signals. Just get a couple ear clips here. Or what's left of them, anyway. <laughs> all those years, <laughs> all those years going to space in my early twenties probably <laughs> <laughs> didn't help. That's the beauty of the brain. It can regenerate and yeah. heal that past damage so we can incur new damage. Out of boy. So I'm going to have each of these ear clips on so the outer part of your ear doesn't emit any electrical activity. So that's okay. why these are just the references where they're compared to all the other sites across your head. Are we able to hear him fine? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So what's going to happen here? So I'm going to place the okay. cap. Um, I'll right. have you hold these guys on your forehead right there. Okay. So the cap is coming on. The cap is coming on. All right. So you can release now. All right. The cap fits you perfectly. So this is going to connect this is to wild. the amplifier. Which is then going to connect to the computer. So tell me, this is the kind of the point in which I would usually be talking to people as far as, you know, kind of their their mental health, their brain performance. <laughs> <stuff. Like, laughs> tell me how much time you got. <laughs> Oh, man, it's your show, so I guess as long as we need. Um, no, I mean, to be honest, I joke around, but I think, I mean, <laughs> in comparison to the people I see on day to day, I think I'm doing pretty well uh, mentally. I've definitely, I can tell you that when I was younger, I was a lot more pessimistic, and I think I kind of trained myself to be more positive and optimistic on things, so I don't yeah, know if that uh, kind of... You think the mushrooms factored into that? Prior to that, it was. I mean, yeah. the mushrooms probably helped, but... Prior to that, I was already on that journey, I guess you could say. Nice. Um, sometimes I'll have trouble focusing, but I think that's everybody. Maybe I don't know, man. I don't think I don't think I have ADD or anything like that. But I mean, you never fucking know. Right. Very. Right. Yeah, I feel like everyone has like a bit of like it's like impossible not to have a bit of ADD in like our society, where it's just like yeah. information overload, like social media. start inserting the gel into each of these tiny little electrode sites and just wiggling it around a little bit so I feel like kind of a cold pace going in yeah I feel it yeah So if someone wanted to do this, would they be able to just call you up and be like, hey, or is there somewhere that they could go? Or Yeah, I mean, if people are in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, I cover the South Florida region in terms of doing, like, in-person brain maps. And then also there's the virtual program that I just launched in which we just send people the device directly. And they do it themselves. And they're able to actually record it themselves. So 
it's not quite as comprehensive. It's why I always recommend people who are local in the area do an in person know, yeah. in person initial session, but then after that, you're fully fully able to go and train your brain on your own time. That makes sense. What is your last name? Alvarez. I got a story here. I don't hope the And then your birth date. 1026, 1990. Cool. I'll definitely I'll definitely edit this out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we're doing some brain mapping for you guys at this moment in time with Toby Neuroflex. We're going to see what's going on under the hood, why I am the way that I am. Never said I don't do anything for you guys. <laughs> brain mapping for you guys. At this Is this a, a good position, like where the camera is picking yeah. up? You want me to tilt the screen at all so it can capture what's on here? So there it's picking it up. This is one of the books that is on it. Yeah, I won't. I will mainly be right yeah. here. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. So basically, what we're what we're seeing on the screen here um, is that me already? Yes. This is oh wow, me. that was quick. Well, that's a bunch of static because we don't have a good connection. Okay. On the right, that is showing. Um, all of the electrode connection we want ideally white is excellent green or yellow oh, oh are also boy. good so <laughs> yeah the the ones that are red those are the ones that need some adjustment so it's nothing to do with your actual oh okay brain. it's it's yeah, okay yeah, yeah. It's, i was it's just, about to say that's a lot of red <laughs> no, man no, 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 no. It's, it's just <laughs> yeah people get confused with that no it's just as far as the the electrical signal that gotcha gotcha you adjust yep got it I was like, we're doing worse than I thought. <laughs> How about as far as like, you feel like a uh, generally pretty positive mood? You were saying like pretty positive outlook, you were saying? Yeah, I mean, everybody has their days, obviously, sure. but yeah, for the most part, and I guess just because I compare it to like, you know, when I was younger. Yeah, I can't can't complain too much, oh, yeah. I think. How about your sleep? Do you have any issues oh, falling man. asleep, staying asleep? I sleep like a rock. Nice. Yeah. Thank God that's never been an issue. Cool. So you'd say overall you're pretty you're pretty happy with like your your brain health at the moment. I think so. I mean I could be a little sharper sometimes, you know, a little more focused, stuff like that, but mm -hmm. sometimes I'll procrastinate on shit a lot. Which maybe that's something with the brain. I don't fucking know. But. Definitely so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, procrastinations oftentimes, and people with ADHD oftentimes have a lot of issues with procrastination because, you know, they're able to focus on, you know, what is super relevant and exciting and demanding attention. Mm -hmm. But if you know that something is due, you have two weeks to do something, a little more. then working on it's not going to be too, you know, it's not going to give the brain that okay. dopamine surge. So... Yeah, sometimes people can really wait to the last minute to work on stuff because it gives you that sort of like surge of dopamine and adrenaline, you know, working on something with a deadline. Sounds about right. That. Yep. Yeah, you have that experience. <laughs> I've always, when I was in high school, I used to wait last minute to like do all the project and be like, oh, I just work better under pressure. I, like, yep, I tell myself clown. the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, so I see all the little red ones turning yeah. white. Yeah. So you got a pretty pretty good connection here. Last two are the forehead electrodes. And then basically what you're seeing on uh, the screen here, so these each of these lines is showing the electrical rhythm at a different location of your brain. So these ones, FP1 and FP2, 
those are the uh, prefrontal sites. Okay. Yeah, so these top ones are the prefrontal cortex, moving down the frontal lobes, and then moving towards the back of the brain, and then these ones at the bottom are moving around to the sides of the brain. So this looks like a bunch of squiggly nonsense, right? So mm -hmm. that's the reason that we convert this data into the 2D heat maps, otherwise known as brain maps, so we can actually visualize what's going on in a way that's going to be understandable. Gotcha. This is the raw data here. And this is what's called an EEG. So EEGs have actually been around since the 1930s. Um, traditionally, I mean, EEGs are usually used a lot by neurologists um, looking at different um, sleep disorders um, or other nervous system disorders, whereas what I do, the, the basically the QEEG, so the brain mapping is a quantified EEG, and that's more so used in mental health, peak performance, really dialing in a lot more precisely on things, whereas an EEG is just measuring these gross abnormalities if someone's having a seizure or, you know, something, gotcha. something like that. Gotcha. So we got an excellent connection here. So I'll show you a couple things. Um, you can try clenching your jaw for me, so you can see that how all that. Oh shows wow! Up there. <laughs> yep, that's all muscle yeah. tension there, because the temporalis muscle that runs kind of across your temple and above your ear that's involved in clenching, that is going to distort those brain signals. So to get the most accurate recording, I'm going to have you try to keep as still as you can while we do this. Okay. Let go of any tension you might be holding on to in your forehead or jaw area. And then also you want to have uh, kind of a soft gaze somewhere off into the distance. Try not to be moving your eyes around too much because I'll show you if you if you look at the screen and blink a few times. There it is. Those big, <laughs> those are, that's not your brain. That is my uh, eyelids. <laughs> that is another artifact. That is your eyelids. Correct. That's so wild. just to try to minimize that, just uh, have a soft gaze off into the distance. Really focus on just trying to relax all the muscles in your forehead and all jaw. Right as much as you can. And then we'll do about a four or five minute recording here, not too much. And then I will be able to process the data and we can explain everything that we found. So I will get you started here. So I'm basically going through here and selecting the best bits of data that don't have any sort of muscle movement, eye movement, that uh, are really good, clean brain data. Okay. And then that's going to get uploaded into the final report. How do you identify that with all those squiggly lines? Like yeah, I mean, there's different things that I look for. So like when you see like a big kind of mm -hmm. swaying like here, that's a big blink. Ah, so gotcha. that's something easy just to avoid and edit out. Other times, like the muscle tension, if we start seeing a specific area, I can't really find too much, too many examples of muscle tension on yours because your yours looks pretty good. So it's actually not too bad editing yours. You've you've given me a good report to work with. Well, you know, I tried. <laughs> yeah, some people you'll see like usually the temporal channels because like they tense up maybe. Forward. Yeah, they're like clenching their jaw to some degree. People like TMJ and stuff, like always have kind of like a baseline kind of tense tension there. Gotcha. So. so predominantly what we're seeing here are beta waves, beta being our normal alert awake state. Okay. But you do have like these bursts of alpha. So whenever our brain kind of gets into a slower kind of disengaged pattern, then we have these like higher amplitude, you know, because these beta waves are very, very tiny here. The alpha waves are a lot higher in amplitude and less in terms of frequency. So for instance, this is, you know, within a second. So if we can count here, we can count, um, say one, I'm counting the peaks of this line. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and we could call this 10. 10 cycles per second is an alpha wave rhythm. Alpha is between eight to 12 times per second. 
So that's just kind of giving you giving you a visual as far as those different brain waves. So it went from beta to alpha during the yeah uh, our time pe- uh, time block. Exactly. Our brain's constantly oscillating between different brain wave patterns, but you'll see these like bursts of alpha when you have your eyes open. When you close your eyes, I'll just briefly show you what your brain looks like there. When you close your eyes, your brain, the predominant state is alpha. So then that's the same deal that occurs when we meditate or do breath work, just really slowing down our nervous system. We start producing a lot more alpha waves. Alpha. But even just closing our eyes for a few seconds will we'll usually do it. People who have a lot of trauma, a lot of anxiety, they'll have what's called alpha blocking. Mm-hmm. So their brain is kind of protecting them by not allowing them to get to into relax, that relaxed to state. Hyper aware Ex- type of thing. Exactly. Which I did not see on yours. We saw some really good, healthy alpha production with your eyes closed, which is good. So this is the software here that is going to upload. So all of these are showing, this is delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. Mm-hmm. So this, once I load your data in, it's going to show the heat map so we can see areas that are either too low or too high. Or too high. So it'll populate, okay. Exactly. So that sh- file should have just loaded. Pull this up. So exciting. Yes. The big reveal. The big reveal. <laughs> Let's see. Last name is Alvarez. Uh, you got it. Okay. Perfect. So this is, there's a couple different ways you can measure it. There's okay. what's called absolute power, which is basically comparing your brain to a normative database of other individuals your same age and gender. Then there's also a way to evaluate your brain, kind of comparing it, comparing it to itself. In other words, with relative power, you're looking at basically there being five slices of a pizza pie, right? Mm-hmm. We know there's five slices, the different brain waves. We're trying. Yep, your brain is running a bit in high gear. So the yellow is mild overactivity, orange is moderate, and red is more significant. So overall. When we take a, a look at this, just from a bird's eye perspective, mm-hmm. you have really good healthy brain activity. We're seeing, for the most part, a lot of white, a lot of healthy activity, but there are a couple of things that we will talk about. So starting with delta. Delta is that brainwave that's mostly produced when we're deeply asleep. So when people have what's called waking delta, when you are just producing a lot of delta with your eyes open, that's usually an indicator of one of two things. Usually... Have you had any concussions in the past? Any head injuries? <laughs> that I know of. Not that you know of? Okay, so not always that. It can be an indicator of that. But also, like, neural inflammation. Sometimes it can be caused by, you know, nutritional stuff, poor sleep, um, stress. There's different things. But basically, when there's delta at a specific location, when your eyes are open, that's indicating that that area is not getting sufficient blood flow and oxygenation to mm. perform optimally. So where we're seeing this, if we zoom in here and look at delta, so we're seeing it primarily from your left prefrontal cortex, that electrode right behind your your forehead there on the left side, and then an area of the brain called the cingulate. So CZ is part of the cingulate, which is a part of the brain that I call kind of the gear shifter. It helps with like mental flexibility. It allows us to, you know, switch between tasks and ideas when people... Um, can get kind of in these stuck thought patterns and loops. They oftentimes have issues with the cingulate. I don't know if you you identify with like ever getting like too stuck on certain thoughts, like you're ruminating on certain thoughts or ideas. Or yeah, that happens. Yeah, a <laughs> it lot. has to happen. A lot. Not not a lot, but it, it, a fair it, amount. A fair amount. Yeah. Okay. But I try and not you know uh, keep stuck there. You know, right. try and switch it up. Gotcha. Gotcha. So. Yeah, so we see that, and then also this area, uh, the left prefrontal cortex. So that area is that one that's you know, that very human part of our brain. So it's involved in attention, motivation, working memory, uh, decision-making, judgment, organization, um, also expressive speech. So that's actually the area F7 that was, for me, really underactive 
relating to that expressive speech that I was able to really improve with neurofeedback training. But all of these are different functions of the frontal lobes. So when you have that delta activity at the left side, that can indicate, you know, that area is a bit offline. It's a little, little bit sleepy. So some of those functions might not be optimal. You feel like looking at that list, did any of those like that resonate sense, as yes. things that could, could, could be improved, right? Yeah. Yep. I'm not going to say it on camera, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Um, there's always one where it's like, I, I don't even know why they include this, but it'll like say like empathy, like as like it like, and then people are always like, wait, so I'm like not, not you're telling me I'm not empathetic. It's like, there's so a lot more complexity to yeah. that. <laughs> but uh, basically the, the main thing we're seeing though um, is, so you have a lot of overactivity within beta. So beta is that brainwave. There's basically the, the lower beta, which is generally like the good beta, for instance, with your um, with the helmet that we just did, we had it at, uh, we had it, we had it at twenty cycles per second. So some of this actually may have been affected by doing that helmet prior to that. Gotcha. Um, but it is interesting because it's just on the left side that we're seeing this overactivity. So that makes me actually think that it might not have an effect um, with as much of an effect with the helmet since you know it was well, getting both the whole sides. Thing, right? So talking about these specific areas on the left side, so this is the left, part of the left frontal lobe, that's F7, that is an area very involved in like verbal production. You ever have like where you're either you like find yourself talking too much or too fast or like forgetting words or... Forgetting words, forgetting yeah, maybe, words. yeah, sometimes, sure. Okay. So, and then talking about like... I always the, had social anxiety growing up. I've yeah. kind of gotten over it a little bit, but I... Still there some, sometimes. Yep, yep. So that's a common, common pattern. Yeah. Um, yeah, so talking more about that area when you have a lot of high oh, beta, yeah, anxiety. So anxiety, ADHD. And again, this is saying possible symptoms, so it doesn't mean you have issues with every one of these, but based on your neurophysiology, you may be more predisposed to experiencing issues with anxiety, anger, uh, sequence processing. I don't know if you ever, like, say, like, with a recipe, like, following... The, like the order sometimes yeah yeah sure <laughs> that's that. crazy yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um visual and auditory working memory you ever have issues like remembering like a like a phone number someone tells you or a mm. your memory pretty good no it's pretty good i pretty think good? Yeah. cool and then word retrieval i know you mentioned that um and then looking at this second area um where we're seeing so this is part of the left temporal lobe so this sits about right there so when we see, so that area also is working really hard. It's producing a lot of that high beta. So again, anxiety um, related to academic performance, that area of the brain, also like face name recognition. You ever have issues if you like see someone that you met sometime? I and won't remember them. You won't remember <laughs> their name yeah. or like their them name. at all. So sometimes, like they, sometimes their name, sometimes at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's like, common. oh shit, yeah, I didn't meet that person before yep. or like shit like that. Yeah. Yep. So that makes sense for that area. How about like metaphor comprehension? Have you ever noticed? No, I'm no. pretty good with that actually. Okay. Cool. So, just a couple more things I'll show you on this. Looks pretty good. So this is looking at basically uh, the symmetry. So basically looking at the left and right hemisphere and seeing are both hemispheres balanced, which is a sign of a healthy nervous system, or is there more activity on the left side versus the right side? So left side is over and right side is under, no? A little bit, but only in a couple areas. So overall, your brain is very balanced, but taking a look, say, in beta, you do have moderately more beta waves at that left side compared to your right side. So some of the things, again, uh, you know, that you're gonna be seeing with this, so potentially anxiety, issues with anger, sometimes memory, uh, selective attention, being able to figure out what we're gonna tune into and what we're gonna be able to block, you know, out. block out, exactly. Uh, facial recognition, obviously we just talked about that. Uh, emotional and behavioral control. How about with auditory processing? Do you ever ha have to like ask someone to repeat themselves? Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Often. <laughs> yeah. Like say that one more time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it seems like it it correlates pretty pretty closely. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Things. Yeah. Yeah. So let's 
Let's take a look. Lastly, I'll show you. So this is the connectivity. So how different areas of the brain are communicating with one another. So on the left side is showing any hyper connectivity, which is basically like too much crosstalk amongst different networks in the brain. So there isn't any. There isn't any. So that looks great. As far as the under connectivity, though, <laughs> we we see almost all brain of it. Dead. We see how it's all emanating from that left prefrontal cortex. So going back to this, right, you know, the, we the talked one you about me initially. We talked about yeah. FP1. So delta, yep, FP one. So that that area has too much delta, which is indicating it's not getting enough oxygen it's blood a flow. Sleepy, yeah. It's a little bit sleepy. So what happens when that area is sleepy is that means it's not properly sending out signals to all to of the these neighboring of the areas. So when you're training the brain, you not only improve that the location in which you put that electrode doing neurofeedback, but you also improve its ability, that location's ability to communicate Send with all of these. To the rest. Yep, with all these neighboring areas. So if I wanted to improve that sleepiness, what steps would I take? The infrared light therapy. Yeah, um, yeah there's different options as far as like the intranasal. There's like a forehead band. Or the helmets are a bit pricier. But, um, but yeah, there's different options. The infrared is great at, you know, dramatically increasing cellular energy, driving more blood flow and oxygen. So that's usually the first tool that I would turn to when it comes to working on this. Now, when it comes to helping these areas where we want to kind of zone in really precisely on these different areas of your brain, neurofeedback would be a great tool where we can basically teach the brain to produce like, say, low beta. That's a good, calm, relaxed state. So we would reward your brain when it got in this low beta state. And then when it starts revving up, the, in, you know, the, the accelerator starts going a bit too much and your brain gets a little carried away into Not these rewarded, faster yeah. patterns, we'd take that reward away. So we can actually help your brain slow down, quiet down some of these areas, as well as speed these areas up. But yeah, so everything, you know, that we talked about and everything that you experience is all stuff that can be changed. Once you have this information, you can leverage, but not even not even just having to do like the technologies because like brain health, you know, really starts with, you know, nutrition, right, yeah. uh, getting sleep. good quality sleep, yeah. exercise. I mean, that's going to make, if you're doing like neurofeedback training and you're getting two hours of sleep at yeah, night you're and you're not, eating crap, you're, you're not going to get the benefits. So, you know, always in terms of like, I'll, I'll send you uh, an email, you know, in the, within the next few days, like a, a report that I would send out to my clients with okay. different recommendations. So covering nutrition, supplements, lifestyle interventions. I'm a big fan of things like morning sunlight exposure. Oh, yeah. Blocking I'm blue light at night. S sun your balls. Yeah, dude, literally <laughs> dramatically increases. To sun. I was literally yes. at a conference. I was on a you see angels I, on your balls. Literally, I, it works. I was literally at a on a conference panel a few weeks ago, and like that topic somehow came up. Like where I like brought that up because we were talking about the benefits of sunlight. Yeah, bro, I've been talking about that shit for yeah. a while. Man. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So yeah, this man, I'll send you a report. But yeah, we can definitely train your brain. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna try and work on that. Uh, yeah, frontal lobe. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the neurofeedback um, would be, I think, really helpful for you. I'll show you. Well, lastly, I know we got to wrap up. Actually, I may not have brought it with me. I'll show you, like, I'll send you, like, a video of, of what it looks like. It's like this kind of headband that connects with an electrode, so you can, like, place it at specific areas to work on. Okay. But you're able to do the training just, like, through an app that it connects to. And then yeah, send me the, the info. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you, brother. Of Yo, course, it's been man. Great. If anybody wants to reach out to you to to have the same, oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if, Toby, if anybody wants to reach out to you to you know get in, in touch, do some of these uh, trainings, where can they find you? Drop your Instagram, your socials, your website, your the whole you know. For sure, for sure. So I'm um, definitely on Instagram. I'm very right. active. So, oh. We talk all right. The yeah, mic. Bring it over. Yeah. Okay. Grab it. Grab it. With your hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, in terms of Instagram, um, Neuroflex is my Instagram. I'm pretty active there. You can go to www.neuroflex.tech to just read up about all these different modalities, and then um, yeah, shoot me an email if you want. Toby at Neuroflex.tech, and I look forward to answering anybody's questions, comments. 
uh, we'll definitely be happy to engage. Cool. Passing over. I feel like I'm on an award show. <laughs> Toby, thanks again, man. This has Absolutely. been so valuable. I'm super And it's glad. super cool. So never, never had anything like this done. Yeah. So definitely was, good shit. I was hoping we'd bring something unique. Awesome. To the table, no, you definitely so. did. Awesome, man. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this podcast today. Again, remember to like, share, subscribe, do all the things. And that's it. That's all the time we got for today. Uh, have yourselves a good day. And like always, no se meta con nadie para que nadie se las meta. Have a good one.